Written in Bone, Chapter 7, Part 2, The Lady of the Manor. The remains in the second lead coffin told the story of a much longer life. The coffin, although better made than the baby's, wasn't perfect. Small nicks in the lead sheeting were caused by errors in cutting. The addition of a small lead extension strip showed that the coffin maker was inexperienced at making lead coffins. That's not surprising, since they were uncommon. The body, however, fit perfectly in the narrow inner coffin made of yellow pine, an indication that the occupant had been slender. The wooden coffin lid had cracked and collapsed onto the skeleton, damaging several bones in the pelvis. Traces of dried tissue still clung to the individual's bones, and a fair amount of fine brown hair covered the skull. Some of the vertebrae showed signs of arthritis. From dental and bone clues, Owsley and Bruelheide concluded that the remains belonged to a slender woman, about 5 feet 3 inches tall, who had lived to be at least 60 years old. Three discoveries confirmed that the, woman, the women who had prepared this body for burial had treated it with great respect. Remnant strands of linen were still wrapped around some corroded green pins, proving that she had been shrouded. So this image here, greatly enlarged, shows the texture of the ribbon that had been wrapped around the lead coffin lady's wrist. And, oh, she must have been slender. Look at how narrow that is. The second lead coffin right here above um, contained the remains of a grown woman. Remember, she was about five foot three and around 60 years old. Her skull was still covered in hair. And, ooh, that's a lot of hair. You can see it right there. Owsley and um, colleague Tim Riordan studied the way the body was uh, treated before burial. So here they are studying her skeleton. The other two pieces of evidence were far more unusual. A silk ribbon tied neatly in a bow around the lady's wrists held her hands in place across her waist. And sprigs of rosemary, a strong smelling herb, were strewn over her body. Rosemary was an herb the English used for remembrance, explained Henry Miller, noting that this custom is mentioned by the character of Ophelia in William Shakespeare's famous play, Hamlet, written in about 1599. Traditionally, Europeans and the English placed cuttings of rosemary at weddings and funerals as a reminder to keep people in one's memories. Seeing this ritual, con this ritual continue on this side of the Atlantic shows how the colonists were trying to follow English tradition, Miller added. As Owsley and Bruelheide studied the woman's bones, they noticed that many had lost mass and become thin. Thinned bones like these are a sign of a condition called osteoporosis which results from a lack of calcium in the diet. The bones of people with osteoporosis become brittle and break easily. Much of the time during the last years of her life, she was in a lot of pain, said Owsley, and she walked with a limp. A quick glance at the lady's right femur was all Owsley needed to make these deductions. The shaft of the bone was enlarged and badly deformed. Several years before she died, she fractured her femur, he explained. When the bone broke, the lower half of the bone twisted and shifted upward. The pain would have been agonizing. When a person breaks a leg bone in this way in modern times, a surgeon realigns the bone correctly and braces it with a metal plate which is fastened to the bone with screws. A system of cables and pulleys, known as traction, may be used to maintain the leg in an elevated, immobile position for a short time as the bone begins to heal. In colonial times, the best that could be done was to hold the leg in place with a wooden splint while the patient rested in bed for several weeks. So these cross sections show that the bones of the lead coffin woman were far thinner and more fragile than the person in the largest lead coffin. Okay, so here is the woman, and then this is from a bone of another person. The lead coffin woman's leg bones showed that she had broken her upper leg bone and that it, that it had not healed well. Because of the break, her legs were of different lengths, and she likely had a painful limp. The large hole is due to ongoing infection in the bone that occurred even after the fracture had mended. Pus would have drained from the infected area through the smaller, smaller holes above. Ooh, look at that hole right there in her bone. You can see the difference. Ugh. 
In the case of the lead coffin lady, new bones had grown in her femur at the area of the break, fusing the two broken pieces together. That's how Owsley could tell that she had broken the bone several years before her death. Bone measurements confirmed what was easily visible. Her right leg was about an inch shorter than the left, more than enough difference to cause a limp. An irregular bony growth on the femur, near the area of the fracture, told Owsley that the broken bone was also plagued with an ongoing infection that occasionally flared up, causing the lady additional pain. But the leg wasn't her only problem. She'd lost 20 teeth by the time of her death. Many of her nine remaining teeth had decayed. Others were worn down to the gum line. The positions of the remaining teeth were such that when she chewed, none of them would have closed together. Furthermore, the roots of these teeth barely held them in place, so it's likely she could only eat very soft foods. Despite these problems, Owsley did find evidence that the woman had tried to take care of her teeth, or at least to make them look better. Her lower teeth, even below the gum line, were marred by a deep hollow that Owsley recognized as evidence of a common method of tooth cleaning. Practitioners wrapped a cloth around a finger dipped it into a gritty paste, and scrubbed the, cl the cloth across the surface of the teeth. Unfortunately, the colonial formula for tooth polish was a recipe for disaster. The ingredients of the paste were vinegar, salt, and tobacco ashes, which contained microscopic particles of an element called silicone. Although the intent was to make the, the teeth appear sparkling white, the salt grains, the gritty silicone particles, and the acidic vinegar actually wore away the enamel of a person's teeth. Over time, the scrubbing created a visible worn area across the teeth. Sometimes this furrow was deep enough to expose the pulp. This treatment undoubtedly contri contributed to the lead coffin lady's tooth loss. Had she lived a few years longer, all of her teeth would have fallen out. In her final years, the lady would have been malnourished because she was unable to eat a variety of healthy foods. It's likely that she was often inactive and at times bedridden due to the chronic infection and pain in her leg. As if the suffering from these ailments wasn't enough, laboratory tests revealed something even more disturbing. So the lead coffin lady only had nine teeth left when she died. You can see her skull here and her teeth. A reenactor, so this is somebody who reenacts from a past period, demonstrates how some colonists brush their teeth. Notice the furrow across the full set of fairly healthy teeth caused by brushing. The lead coffins lady's teeth have the same kind of furrow. So you can see that she's got this cloth wrapped around her finger. Here is a full set of fairly healthy teeth. And then you've got the lead coffin lady's teeth here. The Lady in the Laboratory Laboratory analysis of the lead coffin lady's hair, carried out by Mark Moore at Pennsylvania State University, yielded more information about her life and death. All hair contains trace elements, minerals found in small amounts. Most of these elements, zinc and iron for example, help us stay healthy. The amount of trace elements in the foods and liquids that people eat and drink can affect the levels found in their hair. A strand of hair from scalp to end therefore contains a record of the trace elements that the growing hair has absorbed from a person's body. As a nuclear physicist, Moore knew how to use a device called a nuclear reactor to analyze the trace elements in a strand of hair. Much larger nuclear reactors are typically used as an energy source for the generation of electricity. Scientists clip the woman's hair sample into short lengths and placed, placed them inside the reactor, starting with the segments that grew closest to the woman's scalp. The reactor then bombarded the hair with neutrons. Trace elements that are bombarded with neutrons become radioactive. Radioactive materials emit certain kinds of rays. Each trace element, no matter how small the amount, can be identified by measuring the type and amount of rays it emits. Moore was astounded to learn that the woman's hair contained very high levels of the element arsenic, a deadly poison, and the level of arsenic increased the closer the hair segment was to her scalp. According to Henry Miller, that means in the months before she died, she was consuming more and more arsenic. 
So here we have Owsley removing some of the lead coffin lady's hair for further analysis. You can see he's holding it there. The woman's bone samples also contained a high level of arsenic, confirming these findings. Had the lead coffin lady tried to kill herself? Had she been murdered? The truth is that she was probably trying to get better, and it may have been her own doctor who suggested she take the poison. In the 17th and early 18th centuries, people mistakenly believed small doses of arsenic could cure certain illnesses. Many medicines actually incorporated arsenic as one of the ingredients. Unfortunately for the lead coffin lady, the very medicine she hoped would cure her aches and pains was, in fact, hastening her death. So the claimed remains of the lead coffin lady, right here on the left, see it here. She had numerous aches and pains, which she likely would have tried to treat with a variety of medicines kept in various containers like these right here. In this case, a poverty-stricken person who had wanted to take the medicine but was unable to afford it would definitely have fared better than she did. What might this woman's daily life have been like? Unfortunately, as Henry Miller explained, archaeologists and historians have found little good data about how high-status women lived in early Maryland. Still, they know enough for Miller to make an educated guess. As the lady of the house and a relatively wealthy person, she never would have worked in the fields. She did have a buildup of bone at the muscle attachment sites on her upper arms, however. It's certain that she was physically active, Miller continued. She probably did various household chores, such as cooking, and likely worked in the garden, both female tasks of the period. She may have had a hand in dairying, although milkmaids would have done much of that. The life of the Chesapeake's upper class, while far easier than that of those who worked in the fields, wasn't just a life of leisure. The man of the house. The largest lead coffin was the heaviest and most finely crafted of the three. Two sheets of lead had been fashioned into hexagonally shaped boxes. One had been placed on top of the other so that they fit together in much the way a shoe box and its lid do. Nails driven through the lead and into the wood coffin held the lead securely in, pla held the lead sur securely in place. The wood coffin inside the lead one was made of several kinds of wood. The lid was so beautifully preserved, you could still drive nails into it, said Henry Miller. The lead coffin man was encased in a stout wood coffin that was finely made before it was wrapped with lead. So here we've got another picture. Researchers expected the lead coffin man to have a similarly preserved body to that of the lead coffin lady. Upon opening the coffin, they were shocked to find that half of the skeleton had been transformed into a strange white substance. You can see it here. They determined that the burial ritual of embalming had affected some of its bones. 